Good evening, and uh, thank you for coming. We have great participation tonight, and I really appreciate it. This is a, a joint venture with uh, the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, the Catskill Mountain Keeper, and the Adirondack Mountain Club, or ADK. Um, it's a real pleasure to get together. And let me give a, a little bit of an explanation why we're talking about uh, the Catskills and the Adirondacks and the forest preserves today. Um, so about oh, a little under half of you are new to carry events, which I'll take to mean that you're not very familiar with who we are. We're an independent research institute that does large scale ecological studies. We're based about hundred miles north of New York City uh, on the other side of the Hudson River from the Catskills. But we've had a long tradition of doing research in the Catskills and we helped be found and be part of the Catskill Environmental Research and Monitoring Program, CIRM. The work we did there was on both freshwater ecology, forest ecology and nutrient transfer uh, and transport, which is a, a, an important part of what we do. We monitored acid rain there. We looked at trees and tree growth. And those two areas, are, uh, forests and water are a core part of our work. We also do work on disease ecology, these days, pandemic spillover is sort of taking everyone's attention and it's a core part of what we do. And also we work on urban ecosystems, sustainability, equity, and justice. And so we have a diverse portfolio, but the Catskills have always been a part of our uh, research and a, a really important place for Cary Institute. Um, so we, about three years ago, started something called the Catskill Science Collaborative to try and uh, bring more science uh, to bear on the management and policies that uh, affect the Catskills. Uh, we work very closely with both the DEC, who funds the initiative through the Environmental Protection Fund, and the DEP, the New York State Department of uh, New York City Department of Environmental Protection, which manages the 100,000 acres that are part of New York City's uh, watershed and provide 90% of the water for New York City from the area. Um, I am a member uh, of the Catskill Advisory Group, which was established by Commissioner Basil Sagos at DEC to help figure out uh, what's happening in the Catskills with increased use and how we can manage it. Uh, Kelly Turturro, who is one of our uh, panelists tonight, also is uh, uh, often at those meetings as a representative of DEC who staffs the Catskill Advisory Group and the Catskill Center is very well represented uh, on that, uh, as is the Adirondack Mountain Club. So we have uh, a real convergence there. Uh, let me introduce the panelists. I'll start by saying, in addition being, to being president of Cary Institute, I have been a sometimes resident of the Catskills in Woodstock, New York, uh, for 52 years. Um, so I was very young. I was a child when my folks bought a house up there. So I have a very strong affiliation with the Catskills. Uh, Kelly Turturro has a much more direct uh, impact on the Catskills these days. Uh, serving as uh, the DEC Regional Director in Region 3 uh, since 2016. Region 3 includes two of the four um, uh, counties uh, that are the, that, uh, in, in, that encompass the Catskills um, and, uh, and three others. So it's Orange, Putnam, Rockland, Ulster, Sullivan, and Westchester. So it's a big footprint for, for Region 3. Uh, Carrie, uh, Kelly began her work with, with the uh, DEC as a lawyer um, and uh, has a JD from Pace University Law School. Um, also joining us is Andy Mosey. Uh, Andy has worked at the Catskill Center managing the Catskill Stewards Program uh, with a goal to ensure that the park is prepared to have people visit our local gems with minimum impact. So he is really at the heart of this on the ground uh, he is creative, adventurous, and uh, has been a great partner with the Catskill Science Collaborative, and the center is really an instrumental institution uh, running the Catskill Visitor Center and other uh, areas that are important. Michael Barrett is the executive director of the Adirondack Mountain Club. Michael, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Uh, he spent 20 years as a senior legal and policy advisor in three dif different gubernatorial administrations in New York and Michigan, um, and he is uh, he completed his postgraduate work in Arabic uh, at the U.S. Defense Language School. So, um, you know, the, the, he has a very diverse um, uh, set of backgrounds, and he's been a great addition to the Adirondacks and, and to the New York State Forest Preserves in general. And finally, uh, I think my last introduction is to our, uh, our uh, moderator tonight, 
um, Allison Dunn. Now, many of you may have heard Allison uh, when she worked at WAMC at Northeast Public Radio for many years. She covered environment, culture, and conservation issues, and uh, is very committed to amplifying and increasing uh, diversity and inclusion in her work. Uh, she received the Errol Edward R. Morrow Regional Award for reporting, which, as they say, is a big deal, um, and uh, has been uh, working for the last couple of years as the communications manager at the Catskill Center. Um, so I will do something I very rarely do, which is I'm now going to hand off to Allison, step back and be a panelist. So Allison, thank you for giving me a night off and letting me play. Well, thank you for letting me step in, Josh. I really appreciate that. We have a lot to cover tonight, um, hoping we can get to all the questions and uh, it's just, there are myriad issues here. But let's just lay the groundwork before we dive into the questions. So just kind of define what a New York Forest Preserve is. You know, of the 4.8 million acres of land managed by DEC's Division of Lands and Forests, nearly 3 million acres or 61% are classified as forest preserve, that com comprising more than 2.6 million acres in the Adirondack Park and over 287 uh, yeah, 287,000 acres within the Catskill Park. Now, these lands represent a majority of all state-owned property within the two regions. So, Kelly, with the DEC, we're going to turn to you first for the definition of forest preserve and ask why forest preserves were established. Thanks, Allison. So, the forest preserve are the state lands in the Adirondack and Catskill Park that are protected by Article 14 of the New York State Constitution. That article states that these lands shall be forever kept as wild forest lands. They shall not be leased, sold, or exchanged, or be taken by any corporation, public or private, nor shall the timber thereon be sold, removed, or destroyed. This clause is known as the forever wild clause. So a little bit of history. Uh, before the middle of the 19th century, forests had been primarily viewed as an obstacle to civilization. They were something that people thought should be cleared out of the way for agriculture or cut and sold for profit. By the 1880s, less than 25% of New York State was forest, forested, and the remaining uncut forests in the Catskills and the Adirondacks were quickly disappearing. So in 1885, New York State created what's called the Forest Preserve Act. That was enacted to protect state-owned lands in the Catskills and Adirondacks from further exploitation. This act then was strengthened in 1894 by the amendment to the New York State Constitution, which we now know today as Article 14 of the New York State Constitution. Thank you for that, Kelly. Michael, why don't you dive into the definition of forever wild? What does that mean? How do we manage those kinds of lands? And then what's the blue line? Yeah, so let's just let's take a second and pause it and just appreciate the fact that uh, this, this land, this incredible land that is uh, larger, is about one fifth the size of New York state is protected not in our state statute, but in our state constitution. Now, many of your listeners understand just how difficult it is to change state statute. Think of how different it, difficult it is to change the state constitution, but they did just that because that's just how important it was. So the fact that New York State has protected these lands, the largest contiguous, largest protected contiguous land, lands in the contiguous United States, is pretty incredible. And the and the forever wild clause is just that from the uh, um, Article 14, Section One, and it basically says that um, you know buildings and the things that um, it, in our normal living surroundings are just not compatible with um, the, the forever wild provision. And we wanna preserve um, the wild nature of these forests. Um, and, and, and that's the guarantee, that's protection that exists. Now we can take the whole hour and a half and, and dive into the particulars of, of, of the forever wild provision. Um, but suffice it to say that these are protected lands and the normal types of development that you can do uh, in your towns and villages, you just can't do um, in in the forest preserve, and that's and that's a good thing, and that's something that all New Yorkers should celebrate. You know, the blue line is is really just a colloquialism. We see it here um, that refers to uh, the outline or the border of the Adirondack and Catskill Parks, and it's called the blue line because originally when it was mapped, uh, blue ink was used, as it is here. So that's that's where we get the colloquialism blue line. Thank you for that definition and explanation, Michael. Appreciate it. We're going to bounce it back to you after I go through this question. And 
I don't think I have to tell any of you that the Catskill and Adirondack parks are seeing unprecedented visitation. Obviously last year was huge during the pandemic. Can you tell us a bit about recent visit visitation trends? I mean, has, has the saturated forest of last year, are you seeing that this year? You know, how has COVID impacted things and, and where are we headed, Michael? Yeah, it has, you know, let's just go pre-COVID for a second. Pre-COVID, we were on a decade long upward trend in visitation. Uh, it was going up and up each year. Um, um, as one reference point, you know, in 2009, our summit stewards on, on top of these peaks were um, having about 65 to 70 hiker contacts a day. Fast forward to 10 years later in 2019, um, it, it almost doubled to 102 hiker contacts a day. Um, and so, so we were on that trajectory and, and, and Canadians, we estimate, accounted for about 20 to 30 percent of, 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 um, of, of, of that number. Now, now take the COVID year um, and we saw it go back, you know, um, stay about steady um, in terms of numbers from the previous year, slight increase. Um, but we had to be cognizant of the fact that because the borders were closed um, and, our, and our Canadian friends weren't coming down, uh, what, you know, we had said, oh my goodness, what's happening here? And, and we really experienced a, a significant uptick, I'll call it a something of, a, uh, of an outdoor recreation renaissance among uh, our, our domestic users, uh, which, you know, in a vacuum is, is a good thing, getting outdoors, um, um, many people for the first time, uh, many positive things are attributed to that. Um, and then, and, th and now this summer, what we're seeing is, um, again, with the borders closed, really back down to 2010 levels, um, uh, what we're experiencing. We don't know what that's going, you know, what, what you want to attribute that to, but I, I'll, I'll suggest two factors. Uh, one, the borders are still closed. Um, and also two, unlike last year, um, um, people can go to different places. So they can, t they can visit places uh, in a non, you know, in a non COVID type setting uh, where things are a little bit more relaxed than they could last year. So that really last year, the lack of options really pushed more and more people outside. And so I'll be really curious what happens when the borders open up, what those numbers look like, whether our domestic users will uh, con uh, continue to sustain um, a, a large increase in users or, um, um, on top of the our expected uh, traffic from Canada. Sure, Michael, thank you. And then we'll see in August, right? I think we're gonna see later on in August what sure. this means um, as the borders open up at different yes. dates, uh, US, Canada. Andy, what about in the Catskills? What, what are we seeing in the Catskills? So in the Catskills, we're obviously very close to some pretty major metropolitan areas. Uh, and that closeness has meant that we get a lot of day users and, and day visitation. Um, but specifically here in the Catskill Center, uh, we've been collecting metrics of visitor use uh, since 2018 through the Catskill Stewards Program, which originally started at the Blue Hole location. And since then, we've spread to other uh, really popular locations across the Catskills. And, you know, we've seen very similar things to what Michael was uh, speaking to before. And that is that steady increase year after year. Um, and in fact, you know, we were seeing that from even just 2018 to 2019, a really steady growth overall in the Catskills. Uh, but then 2020 came along and with the pandemic, people just didn't have an, any other options for getting uh, recreation in. So whether that was, you know, locally in their home or, you know, going out shopping, those uh, opportunities didn't really exist. And people really turned to their wild spaces. And for good reason, right? You can get out, you can get away from people uh, and have a really hopefully safe and enjoyable experience when you're out there. And we saw the Catskills across the board really drive up with use and visitation in 2020, uh, more than doubled from 2019. And now this year, we're basically seeing a little bit of a slough off from those uh, 2020 numbers. So the 2021 summer season, definitely noticed it's a little bit more than what we've seen in 2019, but definitely not what we were seeing last year. Right, and spoiler, uh, spoiler alert, we will get to the impacts of all of this overcrowding, but first um, we'll get to Kelly at, at DEC and say, obviously all of this, this saturation at these parks meant DEC had to step in and, and do some, some rulemaking on the fly. So what was going on with DEC? So as, as Michael and Andy mentioned, uh, visitors have discovered how amazing our preserved lands are. And, and that is a good thing. 
That is what they are there for. Um, but it requires DEC to figure out how to employ tools that encourage use and visitors, that protect our natural resources, and that also keep our visitors safe. So that's really the balance that we need to achieve. How do we protect the natural resources? How do we support visitor use? And how do we support local economies? So for DEC, that's really a step-by-step -step approach to determining what tools are appropriate. Um, we need to make a determination on a case-by-case, site-by-site basis. Um, and some of the tools that we use our education, so our forest rangers, our assistant forest rangers, our partnerships with stewards programs. Um, those, those partnerships are key with other organizations and, and user groups to help with that education. Um, as you said, Allison, we have adopted regulations for specific sites to guide our visitors on what activities can happen at certain sites and, and what activities should not happen at those sites. Um, we've added dumpsters and, and portable rest, restrooms at key locations. We've improved parking facilities. And in certain limited cases, we have used pilot permitting systems. So in the Adirondacks, we have a new pilot parking reservation program in partnership with the Adirondack Mountain Reserve. And in the Catskills, we have a permit system at the Blue Hole. So those are some of the tools that, that we've been using, Allison. Thanks very much, Kelly. So what's your take on all this? Well, you know, uh, coming the you know fourth of four in the panel, I can, I can sort of summarize. I agree with everything people have said. I think overall, the increase in use is long-term. It's, it's not a blip on the radar. It's not going away. But overall, it's a very positive thing. In addition to getting more use, we're getting more diversity in the uh, age, race, gender of our of the people coming to visit. And again, that's a great thing. I mean, the parks and the preserves are for everyone. And to be able to do this and to be able to draw people in is important. We will talk, I think, about the ways in which people find out about the Catskills and the Adirondacks. But you know, it does create some challenges. Right? We have greater use of trails leads to trail erosion. There's safety issues uh, in the in the chat uh, and on the on the poll. People talked about congestion uh, and parking as major issues. There are local pollution issues. There are issues about sustainability. And I think what we need to do is understand that uh, the state and DEC, particularly in the, in the uh, Catskills and Adirondacks, has the remit and the mandate to try and figure out how to make sure that visitation is sustainable in the long term and to anticipate and plan for that. And hopefully we can get them the resources they need to do that. And this, thanks, Josh. That's a good segue into our next question is, you know, what are the tipping points for when an area goes from popular to at risk of being overused or harmed? I mean, what are some of the metrics that you tune into? I mean, let's discuss the ecological signals first, Josh. So the ecological signals are going to be uh, many, some very subtle, some not so subtle. So the not so subtle are uh, things like trail erosion, uh, water quality uh, changes. To measure those, though, is the real challenge. DEC and many of the state agencies are very metric driven, but when you have more demands on your staff than you have staff, and you have more demands on your budget because of things like parking and, and safety and, and, and controlling fires and all that, sometimes you don't have the money to do the research. And this is where both universities and private institutions like Cary come in, where we create collaborations and we create monitoring systems because you need a baseline. Uh, for any ecological problem, you need to know where you're starting and then whether the actions you are taking are actually improving the situation. So if you wanna measure water quality, uh, so if you're having fecal contamination, for instance, you'll want to measure water quality and see if you put in some facilities so that people you know, don't poop near the trail, but go and use the facilities. Does that actually reduce the impact of, of the pollution? Right? Sedimentation is another problem that comes with erosion. And if you uh, harden some of the trails and you make them handicapped accessible and you do things that are really very good and very important, does that then have the positive impact ecologically you're looking for? Uh, of course, climate change underpins all of this. You know, we're getting wetter. Uh, the fact I like best to mention is 
in the Hudson River. There's 25% more water flowing down the Hudson River now than there was 25 years ago. The challenge is most of that increase comes in six days right, or eight days of very heavy rain. That very heavy rain also has impacts on the trails and causes washout and erosion, flooding. Um, and climate change has other less direct, but, but perhaps more pesky uh, uh, impacts like um, increases in ticks. Ticks were rare in the Catskills 40 years ago. Now they're common. Uh, ticks were almost unheard of in the Adirondacks 40 years ago, and now they're getting common. Poison ivy likes two things. It likes warm and it likes CO2. So all of you will have noticed there's a lot more of it around and it's gonna continue to spread and get up into the higher elevations. And then there are the problems that, that use springs that are subtle, particularly with things like wildlife. So wildlife reacts to uh, people in the backcountry, and there's a fair amount of research on this. Over time, most animals will you know, get used to people, they'll habituate. But you know, bears can be a conflict with people. Uh, we have to make sure people know about bear-proof containers for their food when they're camping, and then they get really good ones, not just some you know, quirk containers from the supermarket. But also rattlesnakes uh, scare people. And you know, mostly, uh, if you see a rattlesnake, walk around it, leave it alone, it'll leave you alone. And watch where you put your feet, particularly on cool days in sunny places. So people need to learn about the ecology and the way the animals uh, use the habitat uh, that we are invading. Um, I use that jokingly. Uh, but when we move into nature, we have to understand it's their home and we're the visitors. Sure, and we are, you know, hearing a lot of stories about a lot more sightings of bears and snakes this year than than in previous years, um, at least in the Catskills. I'm sure Michael can speak to the Adirondacks. And and Michael, what are some of the ecological tipping points points in the Adirondacks? I mean, I'm sure it differs whether you have wet trails or dry trails, right? Yeah, sure. And and uh, you know, one of the one of the concerns we have in shoulder season when it's wet is. Um, you know, that too much hiker traffic is going to damage these trails. And the DEC just did a fantastic job messaging this year. And, and because of the effect of messaging on the education side, we saw a real decrease use in the trail uh, during shoulder season. But I'll, I'll talk about the ecological impacts, um, uh, picking up on what Josh um, hinted at. And that is, uh, you know, we strongly believe that if you're going to um, uh, assess fairly the impacts, so you have to have some baseline um, of infrastructure out there. And, you know, just to use a bad analogy, you know, if you're trying to measure the safety of a roadway, but the road wasn't paved and, uh, the, you know, the, uh, there was no signage and there was no guardrails and the people driving didn't have licenses, well, somebody would probably raise their hand and say, we need those things first, and then we can fairly assess um, the, the road safety. And so, the same is true with respect to our, our trails. Sustainable tr trails are different than the trails that were built in the Adirondacks uh, 80 years ago, which are, were basically expedient paths from the baseline to the summit. Now we know through research and engineering and, and what our professional and volunteer trail crews use is sort of sustainable trail techniques, things like switchbacks and turnpiking that not only withstand heavy foot traffic, but they also um, are, 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 are really help with um, uh, fighting off some of these more severe and more frequent weather events that Josh alluded to. And so, you know, if we, if we have a trail that erodes quickly, uh, but it's not sustainably built, we don't really know um, the answer here. But if we have a sustainably built trail and it's eroding, now we know that we've exceeded the, ca um, uh, the capacity for that trail. Also, you know, um, restrooms at trailheads, you know, the Adirondacks, people drive two to three hours in the morning to get up to a trailhead. Um, uh, is there a link between um, um, whether there's a bathroom at the trailhead and whether people will use it in the backcountry? Well, I don't think we need a study for that. That's just human nature. Of course, they're gonna more likely if there's no bathroom. And also educational information at these trailheads. You know, you know, how to be prepared, the leave no trace principles, the 10 essentials that you need in the wilderness, and also uh, to educate people about sensitive environment and, um, that they're gonna encounter on that trail. These are the kind of minimum things we need before we kind of, before we get to really fairly assess um, the imp user impact on, on the areas. Thanks for that, Michael. Kelly, maybe you could talk a bit about, you know, 
traffic and congestion, because obviously that was a huge issue and, and measures were taken and we're getting some messaging out there. DEC is getting messaging out there this year to prevent people from going to places that are already crowded. So please talk about that. Sure, Allison. And that really boils down to visitor safety, which is one of our primary focuses in, in our management strategies. Um, and, and as we manage, it, it, is, it is really important to us that we seek local and stakeholder input to, to help guide these strategies. And, and as Josh mentioned in, in the beginning of our program, um, that is exactly why Commissioner Sagos has tasked two groups made up of stakeholders that have expertise in a variety of areas, local government, recreation, natural resource protection, business, and tourism. So these two groups are tasked with providing DEC recommendations on how to address critical issues associated with increased public use of both the high peaks and the Catskills. Um, the High Peaks Strategic Planning Advisory Group, known as HPAG, um, has already submitted a final report to Commissioner Sagos, and we are beginning to see some of those recommendations uh, being implemented. So as I mentioned, the Adirondack Mountain Reserve Pilot Reservation Program, the increased sanitary facilities at trailheads that Michael was talking about, road safety improvements along Route 73, and uh, the work that we're doing on the pilot shuttle system with Essex County and the town of Keene. Now on the Catskill side, um, that group was launched uh, a, a bit later than HPAG, and that group is currently working on an interim report to be presented to the commissioner. But in the interim, we have worked in the Catskills to ensure that there's mechanisms in place um, so increased parking facilities, in addition to message boards that can alert visitors of when an area is full. Um, so those are really some of the tools that we're using in anticipation of uh, the guidance that um, we will be, uh, the guidance and the recommendations that we will be getting from the Catskill Advisory Group. Thanks, Kelly. And Andy, let's talk about those ecological tipping points in the Catskills. So here in the Catskills, you know, we we see on the ground people coming in and and utilizing our forest preserve, which is wonderful. You know, that's as we alluded to before, that's what it's there for. Uh, and as people park in really busy areas, we're starting to see, you know, those parking areas fill up even quicker. You know, and something that we recommend in our stewards program and just across the board is visiting in, in different times to spread out that use a little bit. Um, and the reason why that is the case is because if everyone is visiting at the same time, that's when all those things start to really um, snowball. And we start to see increased trail erosion. We see impacts from recreation in the field. And, you know, Michael was speaking a little bit about uh, uh, switchbacks on trails, which are really wonderful. But unless we have physical barriers in between those different layers of switchbacks and people have a tendency to just kind of cut through those things. So even in areas where we have nice trails in place, it still comes with a piece of education that comes along with it. In the Catskills, we have a lot of more sedimentation and streams. You know, Josh was speaking uh, before about more frequent uh, precipitation across the region. As that precipitation uh, happens in really large quantities in that short period of time, we start to see more sedimentation fill into the streams and creekways. Invasive species are very uh, prevalent all across the Catskills. The Catskill Center has our CRISP program, which is the Catskills Regional Invasive Species Partnership that actively goes out into the field and monitors where these things are and does their best to combat them. And as wildlife comes into people's backyards, uh, even mine just outside of the Catskill Park, we see more bears coming into these areas. So it's all about making sure that people have the right information and are prepared for a safe and enjoyable experience when they get out there. So Andy, maybe you could even expand on that because when people are visiting our, our state forest preserves, what can they do to maximize their outdoor experience, right? Leave no trace is something you could talk about um, while minimizing impacts on nature. So if you could just expand on what you were just talking about, please. Sure, so you know what we're seeing here in the Catskills and the New York State Forest Preserve uh, across the state is not necessarily unique to New York. We're seeing all these trends happening across the country. 
um, in national parks, you know, and forest service areas, even BLM areas. And what we're seeing is more and more people getting outside and those new people who are getting outside don't have the same skills as experienced people do. So, it, you know, it's our responsibility as experienced forest preserve users or as outdoors people to kind of share that messaging alongside with it. So Leave No Trace is an organization, it's a national organization that provides a general overview on outdoor ethics. And basically what that means is it gives everyone the same baseline of information on how to get outside and uh, recreate responsibly. Have a great experience, but also protect the areas where we're going. And we're not talking about like levitating above the ground. We know that people are going to leave a little trace every single time they get outside. And that's expected, right? That's what trails are for, to help to limit that impact to the ecology of the area. Um, and how people get that information really differs depending on where they're going through. That's one of the reasons why the Catskill Stewards Program exists, to partner with the DEC, so that when people come to the Forest Preserve, we can give people that same baseline of information. And I can talk all day about Leave No Trace, but I would check it out. If you are not familiar with it already, definitely learn because you can take those seven principles, which is really the core education components of Leave No Trace, and bring that into your experience every single time you get outside and you'll reduce impacts. You know, you can really challenge yourself to push yourself to creating uh, fewer impacts every single time you get outside. In the Catskills specifically, we have, you know, issues with uh, litter, uh, also invasive species as we were speaking to before. And as those impacts become more prevalent, we have to do more on the management side of things to reduce those impacts because, you know, we need to balance recreation versus conservation efforts. So it's working pretty well here in the Catskills. We're excited about all of our educational programs that do exist. And we just wanna make sure that we're doing more because we're seeing a lot of lost skills every time we go outside. People are really uh, using their phones and GPSs as sole navigation sources. And what that leads to is essentially overusing of really specific locations. Folks hear about uh, you know, one really popular spot, they wanna go there, but I would encourage people to use a map, use a compass and just make sure that you can spread out that use over time. Sure, and especially, you know, if your phone goes dead or you don't have a connection, you know, that that's a really good skill to have are those map skills, um, you know, apart from not going to overcrowded places. Michael, what about in the Adirondacks? What, what can be done to mitigate the impacts there? So this is one of the great things is that as an individual user, you yourself can do a lot to make an impact. And so what I would suggest to folks is, um, you know, one thing is, you can re reduce um, uh, use on the trail by going on, but going midweek, um, and you don't have to focus on the high peaks. One of the wonderful things about uh, the Adirondacks, it being so large, um, you know, larger than, you know, some of the some about four or five national parks combined, is there's no shortage of places to go, and 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 so you know don't don't go to the high peaks, um, Eastern high peaks necessarily. And if you need to, if you want to desperately go, you know, choose a time that's not as busy. Um, find those lesser known areas and, and you know, they're, they're easy to find. And that's a great segue into where do you get your information? You know, back in the eighties and before, you know, the, where people got hiker information was friend to friend contact, the local outfitter, as well as hiking clubs like the Adirondack Mountain Club. Now, uh, the hiking information is, is at your fingertips and it's limitless. The problem is, it's, is we don't necessarily know how to distinguish between good information and bad information. And even among the good information, such as just trail information, that's all you're getting is just trail information. You're not getting uh, the backcountry ethics that you would get. You would not get uh, the knowledge of a local outfitter um, that assesses your, um, your capability level. To, to know enough to, to guide you away from Mount Marcy on your first hiking adventure and perhaps towards a, uh, a more manageable challenge. And so where you get your information is also key. Absolutely, thanks. In the interest of time, I'm gonna ask for a really quick answer. I'm gonna to go to Andy and Michael on this one. Andy, would you share an alternative site please uh, to recommend? Sure, so one thing that I will say is in the Catskills, we do have really great trails to some of our fire towers that are designed to handle tons of use. So places like Overlook are really good. But, you know, again, visit those during uh, different times. And also check out Western Catskills, some of those lower peaks. You don't always have to go to the high peaks, as Michael was saying. 
Right. And I yeah, think, Michael, did you mention the paddling? I think that was something that you were offering as an yeah, alternative. Yeah, get, get out in the water. That's that's a great option. But to, to not to evade your question totally, uh, there's a paradox associated with this question because I know that outdoor writers uh, are loath to recommend a hidden gem because as soon as you mention it, it's not a hidden gem anymore. And, and, and so I'll be a little bit coy. But I do want to give a shout out to the Champlain Valley. So instead of, you know, you drive up the north way, instead of turning off on exit 30 to go to Keene Valley and do the eastern high peaks, keep going. They've, they're developing quite the robust trail network up there in the Champlain Valley. And it's just beautiful. So keep going north. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Kelly, I just wanted to give you an opportunity briefly to talk about outreach and education at DEC. So I'll, I'll be quick, Allison. And the one thing I would like to mention is our new Love Our New York Lands campaign. So this is a campaign that we have that encourages visitors to plan ahead, visit responsibly, and practice those leave no trace principles that Andy was talking about. As part of that campaign, we also have a new Twitter handle on social media. It is at NYSDEC Alerts. And it provides real time updates for some of our DEC managed lands. So is the parking lot full? Are we at capacity at, at, at the facility? Um, you can get all of that on Twitter. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, Allison. Thank you, Kelly, appreciate it. We just have a lot to work through here and not much time left. So how can science inform best management practices and forest preserves, especially given the realities of climate change, Josh, like you were talking about you know, before. So, Josh, talk about perhaps the Catskill Science Collaborative, please. So, so we established the Science Collaborative with three intentions. The first was there was no advocate for research in the Catskills. The, the Adirondacks, Michael knows, were the sort of, uh, we feel like the poor stepchild often. And so we didn't have that. And so we've been working with universities and students doing studies on invasive species like the hemlock woolly adelgid, trying to reduce human black bear interactions, evaluating aquatic habitat or, or modeling stream uh, channel dynamics and sediment flow. So we've got real research projects that feed directly into DEC and DEP's management priorities because they help us define those projects. We also have a database and we have a website we're going to have uh, a, a way to access, store, and make accessible data sets and publications about the cat skills. Um, we try and you know make what we're calling a science infrastructure. And finally, the big third area is trying to give visitors and residents uh, real opportunities to learn about what we do. Our favorite way of do that to do that is of course pub talks. Uh, pub talks have not been possible. So for the last 14 months, we've done virtual pub talks and everybody has to bring their own beer. It's not as much fun. Uh, but this has been a really great way, not just to foster new research, but to make sure that research and monitoring that is already ongoing and has been going on for a very long time is available to everybody. Mute, I'm sorry, I was so engrossed in your answer. I kept myself muted there. Um, DEC, you said, supported the effort, of course. Andy, what about an example of science-based management that's working in the Catskills? So uh, wherever the stewards are, we do our best to capture metrics on site and we provide that to the DEC. And a lot of what that does is helps to showcase um, a couple of different management strategies that the DEC uses. So limits of acceptable change is, is one of those. And we basically when we take those numbers and we're able to see the people that are coming in and, and frequent visitors, then we're able to make better management decisions for the long term by showcasing that trend over time. Um, so it's working places like Catterskill Falls, for instance, um, Blue Hole. We're in a good place with our management strategy for those locations. Everything always needs to be tweaked and we have to adjust, um, but it certainly is working there. And the one thing that needs to stay consistent with everything is that, man is that messaging across all stakeholders in a given area needs to be very consistent. So that includes tourism agencies and it includes you know, uh, land management agencies and also nonprofits making up that voice. Thank you, Andy. Michael, what about research in the Adirondacks? You know, one of the great examples is how our summit stewarding program is partnering with the state um, to do research. You know, you go back to the 1980s um, and the, the state of the Alpine zone, the flora and fauna, the rarest ecosystem in all of New York state was in real jeopardy. And so no one thought it was going to come back. 
And then we started putting summit stewards on top of there to teach people to stay on the rocks and tell them about it. And, and, and it's, it's, it's turned around incredibly. And you see a great picture there of, of, of people on the rocks getting educated about um, the, the Alpine zone. And we're combining that now with photo, key photo point monitoring in that area um, to um, keep an eye on things um, and providing that data uh, to the state. So here we are, nonprofit, um, uh, partnering uh, with the state um, uh, to protect the most rare ecosystem and also to provide data points that'll help the decision makers and the policy makers um, draw conclusions and allocate resources um, appropriately. Thank you, Michael. Um, I want to get to a really important uh, question and topic, and that's about access. And Kelly uh, at DC, we'll start with you on this. I mean, what are we doing to ensure that access is equitable for all people? And I mean, someone might ask, well, what do you mean by access? You know, we're talking about access for people with disabilities, access for people of socio different socioeconomic backgrounds. I mean, access for all, A-L-L. -L. But I think you probably want to talk about people with disabilities, Kelly, so please. Thanks, Allison. So yes, two 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 approaches um, for for the access for people with disabilities. We we are committed to providing an ever increasing range of accessible opportunities. We we strive to make our facilities as accessible as possible, and are continually working to upgrade them to meet the current accessibility standards. We have ADA accessibility coordinators within the agency that help us to ensure our facilities are meeting those standards. Some good examples that we have are our campgrounds. Um, we have accessible fishing piers, accessible picnic tables, fireplace rings, um, shower buildings. Um, and in the Adirondacks, you can, you can look at Frontier Town, um, which, it, which was built to be fully accessible. In the Catskills, we have done a tremendous amount of work at Kenneth Wilson Campground um, on accessibility for, uh, um, opportunities. Um, as far as access for all, that is another focus for us as well. Access to the forest preserve must be universal. Um, many of our sites were designed to provide people with choices about the type of recreational experience they want and the level of personal challenge that they prefer. But as Andy and Michael were talking about, planning is key. And, and our unit management planning process comes into play in this respect. So, so we have for each land parcel that we manage, we have a unit management plan. And that is the process in which we can ensure universal access by planning for and providing various experiences for our visitors. This process also allows public input so that the community members um, can, can have some input into things that we're proposing. And then finally, something else that we're working on is promoting diversity and equity for all of our visitors. Thank you, Kelly. And um, Andy, I'm and, um, sorry, Michael, you're there. So I'm going to ask you about in the Adirondacks for access. Yeah, I, I think we're all talking a lot about access and uh, equity um, lately, because I think there's a, a there's a consensus that we need to do a better job. And um, that's good. That's the first step. You know, on the ADA side, um, you know, the, there is tremendous um, 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 access and resources at our state parks, but we can do a better job in the Adirondacks. Um, we have a ADA um, a trail boss who is um, skilled or certified in building ADA trails, um, but there's, you know, we're having a hard time finding money to build those trails. And, and I really don't know where they exist in the Adirondacks, uh, in the forest preserve. And so we need to do a better job there in terms of um, um, a diverse access. You know, we're doing some things at the Adirondack Mountain Club because we recognize that we need to do a better job. And so one of the things that we're doing is we use COVID to um, uh, make lemonade out of lemons and take our educational programming, including our three seasons at Heart Lake, which was um, um, a program for area fourth graders in the North Country, and created a, a virtual um, a version of that. And now we're reaching children um, in urban areas throughout the state. So we actually grew our impact programmatically during COVID. So that's great. 
And we're also partnering with nonprofits, uh, for instance, uh, Coco in, in Schenectady and the Boys and Girls Club in Albany uh, to come to them in their environment and teach them um, some outdoor skills like map and compass, and then facilitate through our, um, our outing leaders and our chapters, uh, the first wilderness experience for some of these uh, young people who wouldn't otherwise have um, um, the means or ability to get outdoors. And then we need to look at uh, breaking down barriers that exist perceived and real uh, uh, to improve access. And, and, and you know, and one of the things is, is transportation and recognizing that that's an obstacle or the percept, you know, if someone feels like they're gonna get pulled over at a much greater rate going up the North way, maybe they don't, maybe they're fearful of going. So we need to address this comprehensively and, and I'm glad so many people are at the table trying to figure this out. Thank you, Michael. I want to give Andy a chance to answer this question before we wrap it up and get to other questions from our from our audience. So here in the Catskills, you know, we have uh, accessible trails um, in many different locations. And one of my personal favorites is over at the Ashokan Rail Trail and West Shokan. And someone, no matter their ability level, can access this trail. It's really fine crushed stone. It's very flat and level. You go 13.1 miles with beautiful views of water and the Catskill High Peaks. It's stunning. Uh, if you haven't checked, uh, seen it or been there before, I definitely check it out. You know, if you are visiting the Catskills and are unsure of where to go, one of the best resources we have for all of your information in one place is the Catskills Visitor Center. So stop on in. We have really awesome flat level trails there as well, nice and wide, uh, and also a fire tower there for your enjoyment. So check out those locations available for all level ability levels but also body types and we're doing our best to make sure that the cat skills can be accessible for all thank you andy i lied i'm gonna get to a bit of a lightning round before we get to our to our q a so kelly let's start with you and the question is what can people do right to to leave no trace and all the stuff we talked about how can they be impactful in a good way love our new york lands Thank you, Kelly. Michael? Yeah, um, be, be an ambassador, you know, meet people where they are, recognize that many people are getting outside for the first time, make sure that it's a welcome experience and, and, and appropriately share with them some of the knowledge that you might have as a more experienced hiker. Thank you, Andy. And to just expand off of what Michael was saying, again, check out something called Authority the Resource Technique, which I just saw come up on the ADK's Instagram. Really good, check it out. Uh, but a separate recommendation, just plan, 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 plan for your experience. And then if you're out there and you really want to take a photo, sure, take a photo of that beautiful location, but you don't necessarily have to say where it is. Thank you, Andy. Josh? Uh, so I'm going to say, don't give us money, but give those organizations in the Catskills and the Adirondacks who are doing the great work, like the Mountain Keeper, like the Catskill Center, like ADK, so they can continue to work with the DEC. And make sure you tell your representatives that this is important to you. I know Kelly can't say that, but I can. And make sure that, that politicians know that you care about the state forest preserves and the state parks. Thank you so much for that. We're going to get to some of the questions we have here. And one of them kind of builds on what we talked about just before the lightning round. Um, someone is asking, is spreading out visitor use to less used trails good for wildlife or not? It seems like sensitive wildlife would just be chased away from more areas. Maybe it's better to concentrate visitor use. Who wants to take a stab at this one? I'll jump in quickly and say yes. Um, <laughs> you know, yes, we want to concentrate use, but we also want to make sure that, that we don't concentrate it too much. I think the good news is almost every species gets used to some level of disturbance. And so over time, I don't think it's as much of a problem, particularly in the backcountry. But we don't have things like, you know, uh, wolverines are really sensitive, but even they get used to things. So I think we're OK, but we just have to be careful. Thank you. Uh, anyone else want to take this on? So Allison, that, that's where our planning comes into play. Our foresters, when, when they're looking at mapping out recreational areas in our units, um, they, they look at the species, the plant species, the animal species that are in the area, and they, they plan around that. Thank you for that. 
you know, I actually have a question here that we were going to have in our question. So I'm just going to turn back and ask that question because it answers a bunch of, of similar questions that we have. And that's about, in, you know, how do we ensure that the forest preserve is prepared to meet the needs of recreation and resource protection now and for future generations? So Andy, I think, you know, probably stewards is a good place to start there, right? Yeah, when it comes down to visitors coming to a forest preserve or really any natural area, if we notice that, you know, majority or even half of the people who are visiting have never spent time outside before, then we need to give everyone the same level playing field. You know, when we're talking about access, we also want to make sure that those folks who are coming in and don't have that experience have that minimum level of, of experience getting out there. So the stewards play that vital role of educating visitors when they come out and do it in a really friendly way because that's why we're all there. We're outside having a good time and we want to make sure that that experience is really beneficial for everybody. And then in turn, those people who are recreating can help protect that area and become stewards of their own, and hopefully inspire others to do the same, but it's not easy. So that's why we're out there every day. <laughs> No, you'd be amazed that even seasoned hikers can have something to learn, right? I mean, <laughs> there's always information oh, yeah. to impart and we all can learn something. Michael, how about you? Yeah, so again, I can't overemphasize education. And you know, it's our experience, there's plenty of exceptions. It's our experience that people who get outdoors are a conscientious group and they, they're really receptive to being educated and to learning more. And so that's a great thing. You know, one of the one of the strategies that we've started using is, you know, sometimes when the, we interact with folks when they get out of their cars at the trailhead, that's that's too late because uh, you know, they're beelining for the trailhead and they don't really want an interaction at that point. And that's a challenge. And so we think it's so important to develop strategies to reach people uh, as they're planning their trip. And so we partnered with DACMAP, which is a, um, a, a, an application for all things Adirondack. Um, and we're trying to promote it to individuals in the, in, who really frequent the Adirondacks, like Northern New Jersey and the Capital Region and Rochester and Buffalo and even the Hudson Valley. And so if they get on the app, we can give them educational videos um, um, before they go. And they're also getting things like parking lot capacity. And so they'll know before they get off the Northway whether um, a, a parking lot is full or not. And so we're combining that practical information with substantive education um, that, that helped them have a safe and responsible experience in the back country. Thanks, Kelly. I know uh, talking about partnerships and stewardship programs, maybe you wanna also talk about adopt a trailhead here. Thank you, Allison. Um, so, so three categories that I wanna weigh in on in terms of DEC's focus. So, so we have a great team here at DEC our forest rangers, our assistant forest rangers, and our foresters um, that are all out on the ground. But as you said, partnerships are key. Partnerships with, our, with the organizations like Adirondack Mountain Club and the Catskill Center, New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, who have people out there on the ground and are helping us deliver that message. And then we also have the volunteer opportunities. So the Adopt a Trailhead program that you mentioned, this is an opportunity for members of the public to actively care for state lands and educate visitors on, on the value of responsible recreation. So they reach out to us, they're assigned a local trailhead, and they would go out there and, and greet visitors and educate them about local conditions, leave no trace principles, um, help us pick up litter. Uh, the other aspect we have is, is what we call a, a volunteer stewardship program. So that is a program that provides an opportunity for, for the public to assist with maintenance of our trails, lean-tos, um, and, and some other needs on state land. Thank you, Kelly. Josh, um, love to hear from you on this, um, how we ensure that forest preserves are prepared to meet the needs of the future. Well, you know, I, I was looking while we were talking at the Q&A, and there is a lot of concern about advocating for recreation, advocating for more access, I think the reality is that we can do more and we can, you know, as it were, have areas that are wilderness and have areas that are much more used. I think that's important because we're not going to be able to sustain this into the future, particularly with the increased threats that they we're facing without real political support, without financing. And if the Catskills and the Adirondacks and the state parks are, per are perceived as places where people can't go, they won't get funded, right? So it's a delicate balance. And I think we have to be aware of that. I just wanna, you know, education is such a key piece to all of this and on many levels, 
where does one go for the education if they're not going to the place where stewards are, for example, or the forest ranger is? Um, you know, where is the person getting this information? How are we supposed to be arming them? People are getting education for hiking right now, currently, in pretty basic locations. So most people find out from simple hikes uh, on things like all trails or uh, even Google Maps or Facebook groups. And you know what we need to do as a hiking community or just people getting outside is make sure that all the good information that we're trying to do, we're working with those entities to make sure that the educational components that are really necessary for a safe and enjoyable but also responsible experience are included within those sources. So when people instantly turn to their phone to look for the next hiking trail to do, uh, they get that with them. But what I would recommend is make sure that you have a map, make sure that you have access to a visitor center and that you take some time to check out sources like Leave No Trace, Catskill Center, Adirondack Mountain Club that really partners with Leave No Trace to get that education uh, across to the visitor, specifically, information for that given location where you're going. Before anyone else chimes in on education, if you'd like, I'll certainly give you the chance. I just wanted to mention to those who are tuned in uh, that if they wanted to stick around for a bit, we will continually uh, continue to answer some questions, ask and answer. So we will stick around for about what, 10, min 10 more minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes max. Uh, so stay tuned if you'd like, we'll continue this conversation. And, and at this point, I'll just go back and ask uh, who didn't chime in, who wanted to chime in on this education question. Yeah, I'll, this is Michael with the Mountain Club. I'll, I'll say if, you know, if you're going online and, and you're uncertain about the credibility of a resource uh, for information when you're trying to look outside, a great place to turn is to organizations, both public and private, with a reputation uh, for caring about uh, the lands that you're going to use. That includes your, you know, groups that, that Andy talked about, but also your local outfitters. If they're giving, um, uh, you know, uh, guided hikes, um, then they care about that land. And so that's a great place. And also, you know, your local hiking club, their local outings club. Those are, those are, those are great places to turn uh, for information. Thank you for that. Um, I have an interesting question here. Um, well, also, there's a comment from, from the audience about, you know, to avoid congestion, just get there early. But we're talking, you know, 5.30, 6 a.m. I mean, now, you, now you're in for, for quite a day if you're not camping or, or staying over. I mean, is that is that one of the answers? Just get there at 5 or 6 a.m.? Anybody want to just, uh, we, we'll it leave that rhetorical. Can I, we can leave it rhetorical <laughs> if you'd like, but. You know, it can be, it really depends on the given location. You know, there are places that are definitely busy, but sometimes, you know, at least I'll speak from personal experience when I have a large objective for the day, if I'm going really far into the wilderness and I don't want to stay overnight, you know, I'll have all my really important pieces of gear with me, but I'll start early. I'll start, you know, at four in the morning, five in the morning to make sure I have enough time to get all the way back to where I'm trying to get to and then all the way back out. So it's certainly a useful tool to utilize uh, state lands and public lands early in the morning, um, but even seven in the morning at times is, is usually sufficient. Yeah. Sure. And I mean, if you spread out, if you spread out the traffic, so to speak, the human traffic, are you spreading out the impact? I mean, will it have that positive effect of spreading the impact, Michael? Yeah, you know, I can talk about, you know, our, the, our location, which is perhaps the busiest trailhead in, in, in the state with 100,000 visitors a year, 200 cars, uh, two to 300 cars a day. And our parking lot often fills up um, at, by 630 in the morning. So certainly what um, the person who proposed the, the question is uh, certainly that's the common strategy. Um, and if you are absolutely intent on a specific hike, that's what you may need to do. All we're suggesting is if you want to be part of the solution, there are strategies that you can employ to have a great wilderness experience and, and really reduce that high use. And that's going midweek, that's um, you know, spreading out your, the, your, um, your use where you go, um, and perhaps taking the road less traveled. Um, and uh, you know, so there's things that everyone can do, but um, that may be your only option if you're, if you're taking one of those popular hikes. Absolutely. I have, we have a bunch of questions uh, pertaining to invasive species, and I know at least one of you did touch on that, but you know, what can people do to help with invasive species? I mean, like I said, we had a lot of those questions. So 
who would like to start us off. Michael, you're up, you wanna take that? Yeah, here's another, you know, so many things that we're talking about, what's great is it's not out of our hands, right? And there's big things that we can do as individuals. And, you know, for boat owners, clean drain and dry your boats. Uh, for the rest of us outdoor recreationists, clean your boots and your gear. Um, and, and, and if you wanna learn more, if you really wanna get smart on, on these issues of invasive species, which we absolutely need to combat and prevention is better than treatment here, I can assure you that. Go to the key resources and learn more. That's the Adirondack Invasive Plant Program, that's APIP. Also the DEC website is great. And also there's IMAP Invasives, which is a mobile app. There you can map, you can report when you find something so that the scientists and the people who are, are specialists in this can intervene early in where these things are popping up. So Allison, I'll just uh, uh, plug the Tree Smart Trade Program, which is a program Cary Institute started to try and keep new invasive pests from coming into the, uh, into the system. Because almost everything comes in on woodpack material, pallets, and ornamental plants that are brought in for overseas, from overseas, from Europe and, and Asia particularly. Thank you for that. And, and Kelly. Allison, just building on what Michael was saying, um, sign up for DEC's uh, website. We, we are constantly issuing press releases about um, information we're seeking on invasive species as, as well as a lot of other topics. So if you sign up for DEC Delivers, um, people can get all that information from our website. Thank you, Kelly. And Andy, before we go to you, I just want to mention we do have some resources in the chat box. So if you want to check that, if you're tuning in, um, people are, are, our panelists are putting some resources in there. Andy, invasives, what do we do? How can we help? So uh, in terms of individual efforts, quite a bit. And uh, I like to think of how I like to keep my gear, which is relatively clear, clear, clean, and in good working order. So something I do right, <coughs> excuse me, right at the end of my hike is I put all those things in my bag and then I take it home and I stuff it all in the laundry machine and I wash everything. And that helps to really limit the amount of things I'm going to bring to the next trail I check out, which might be the Adirondacks, it might be the whites, it could be somewhere else. Um, and so I really want to limit that. If I'm driving long distances, I'll even wash my car because it's, uh, pests such as a spotted lanternfly, those egg masks really form on cars and that is one of the more common ways at least between recreationists, how they're getting from point A to point B. Things like wood, you know, generally we have, there's a, been a big PR uh, push with the emerald ash borer. And people know not to bring firewood from location to location and just get it locally. That's the, the nicest and easiest thing to do. So here's a question, you, you know, you talked about what you wash and we know that DEC's, you know, talked a lot about wood and, and cleaning boats, right? Before you get it, get on, on the waterways. What about hiking poles? You know, those are dipping into a lot of different things. And, and I haven't heard anybody talk about cleaning off your hiking poles. Andy, you want to continue with that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can absolutely and should clean all your gear off and, and hiking poles fall into that. They don't necessarily trap a lot of the same things that are more of a hardened material than others. But what I would watch out for are your boots. Boots are easily have the most opportunity to carry seeds and other pests from location to location. Uh, I actually got a really cool DEC boot brush, it lives in my car, and I use the pick to clear out the lugs and then the brush to clean out other things I need. It's also useful for whatever else I need in the car. It's pretty cool. So from hiking poles, I'm panning back to, to a big picture item, obviously climate change, Josh, you probably wanna take a stab at this first and then we can go down the line. But you know, obviously we have changing weather patterns, right? More, look at the summer, it's been so rainy and so many storms and hundred degrees and then 40 degrees. And how are we protecting areas from erosion? I mean, all of that water has to go somewhere. It goes down, it goes down the mountain. Um, so what, what can we do? So I'll let people who know more about trail design and I think that's both uh, Michael and Andy uh, and probably Kelly as well. But I think what we have to recognize is that this is the norm, this is not exceptional, right? This summer has been exceptionally wet, but we will have exceptionally wet and exceptionally dry summers. The thing about climate change is it is increasing the extremes. And I think people are starting to really understand that. The thing I worry most about is in those extremely dry periods, that we might get fires back. I mean, we have fire towers in the Catskills and the Adirondacks because there were fires and there still are fires there. 
Now, obviously, when it's this wet, it's harder for them to take off. And lightning strikes that, that start fires, you know, can easily either naturally uh, quench themselves or or be put out. But I think that's my biggest fear in a sort of 20 to 40 year time frame. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, what about, you know, designing trails? Yeah, I mean, trail building is in and trail maintenance, uh, which oftentimes goes uh, overlooked, is a big part of the Adirondack Mountain Club. You know, we were started in 1922. Next year is our hundredth anniversary. And we were started as an organization of people who wanted to give people the public access to the Adirondacks. And we did that through trail building. Sadly, though, when the first um, a bunch of trails were built and, and for much of the, the early part of the, of, of, you know, the, the last hundred years, um, they, they were not built they were, uh, with environmental uh, concerns in mind. And, 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 and we, we didn't know a lot about this. And so they were just expedient routes, as I said earlier, from the base to the summit. Now we know so much more. And so we need to do two things. Um, one, um, for those people out there, and there's a lot of them that don't know that you build a, you, how you build a trail and, and what, why it's meaningful and what, what the impacts are, we need to educate them. That includes in the capital. They need to know that we can do things to the trail to make them more sustainable, to make them more resilient. And that's something we need to focus on is building the, um, uh, the sophistication level uh, of not just the public, but also our policymakers, that there's things that we can do. Um, you know, and, and so, and, and those, and, and there's things that we can do uh, on the trail, as I mentioned, um, to withstand some of these severe and more frequent weather events. Um, and then when we do those things and, and there's still um, erosion, um, now we need to look at other strategies. But that's a first step is, is a state partnering with, with organizations, both private and nonprofit, uh, to help build these sustainable trails and maintain the, maintain the existing trails. Absolutely. Kelly, what's going on at the DEC when you're looking forward and, and seeing what's happening with the climate about trail building? Right. So, so just as Michael said, um, that is a focus for us, uh, both backcountry and front country, ensuring that the things we are building, the trails we are building, we are building sustainably. Um, to, to be able to stand up to these changes in our climate that are happening. We, we, are, we are partnering with organizations um, that are doing that, that, that trail building um, and, and helping us to, to shore up those, those trails. Thank you for that. Andy, anything to add to this before we wrap it up? Yeah, you know, there is a, a certain level of of uh, a high level look that we need to have at on trail building, right? Because everything that we've said so far is 100% accurate and needs to be taken uh, advantage of. But we need to think about these areas as specific locations, right? There needs to be intensive use areas so we can drive people to those locations and they can utilize really hardened, mostly level or you know mild elevation changes. Um, and those trails can withstand a large carrying capacity. Then we have need to have those more wild forest areas where you have a little bit more people, um, but it's also a little bit more of a wild experience. And then finally wilderness, which you know need to be really well planned out trails, but then also have those areas where there's less of that maintenance in, in place because the wilderness experience is really important as well. So it's about balancing all those different things. But as we're looking forward in the future with trail building, with trail maintenance, we need to use what we know now, you know, how we build trails now is a lot more sustainable than we did a hundred years ago. And we need to take advantage of those techniques moving forward. And anytime we go out and do trail maintenance, definitely using, you know, rock armoring and muddy sections of trail so that people are less likely to go around it and make a wider trail over time. That's what happens when you have a really large mud puddle. People are less likely to go through the middle, even though that's the best thing we can possibly do in a muddy section of trail. As we go around it, that trail grows wider and wider over time. But if you have a few rocks down the middle of it, then all of a sudden people have skipping stones to walk across and then we reduce that overall impact. So utilizing what we know now in modern trail building technology is, is our best step forward. Thank you, Andy. And thank you to all our panelists. And Josh, I'll let you close it out. Well, thank you very much. And I really appreciate uh, everybody's uh, engagement uh, we had 180 participants at the top of the of the level, and uh, then we will uh, 
we're down to 100 and we're now 12 minutes over time. So we really have people staying. Let me thank Andy, Kelly, Michael, and Allison, you for your participation. This was a really great uh, event. We'll have it recorded. We're going to be sending an email uh, for anybody who registered with a video um, and to the panel. And we're in that, you know, Lori Quillen has been and is typing away in the, in the Q&A. Uh, if you click under the answered section, there's lots of information. I'll say a few more things so people can go and cut and paste. Um, but, you know, if there were materials you'd like to share, if there are things you'd like to know, uh, feel free to contact us. And uh, again, thank you very much. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not thank Harney and Sons. Uh, the slide is up there to remind me. Uh, the Harney and Sons Tea Company, um, family-owned business in Millerton, New York, uh, with global reach. I have seen them in Colombia. I've seen them in England. Uh, they're, they're a great company with great teas, and they support uh, much of our public programming, particularly in the pandemic. It's been great to have that support. Um, so thank you all for coming. Tell your friends, tell your family, and come back soon. And uh, again, have a wonderful evening. And it says that we're going to have a sunny Saturday. So enjoy it if you can.